I'd like to introduce Joanne. Y'all know Joanne, right? Everybody knows Joanne. For your information, Joanne's graduated in the 2010 class, 2010 docent class. She's been here 10 years. Joanne is native to Southern California. She graduated with a history and teaching degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. She and her husband, who is an engineer, spent 25 years in the Inland Empire, but now they live in Redondo Beach, not far from Redondo Union High School. Joanne is also an active volunteer with Madrona Marsh, as well as Los Serenos. Okay, Joanne, you're on. That's it, huh? Okay. Um, my title is sharing just a bit about the native people who lived here on the Palisades Peninsula. And I have for about the past four or five years done the introductory um, class for our new docents on the Native Americans. And it was about three years ago that I kept doing my research and I came up with my theme here that nothing is absolute. And I think that's really um, a key that you need to keep in mind as you, as you listen today, but also as you talk to our guests about um, Native Americans. Um, I was a history major in college and became an elementary school teacher. So I confess to not being someone who is wildly excited or even extremely knowledgeable about Native Americans. Since I was asked to take over this uh, presentation, I have studied hard, I've learned a lot, and I do seek out anything I find of any interest in, the, in these past several years. I, I will say I have accumulated quite a bit of information. Um, second, I'd like everyone, like everyone else, I'd like you to know that I come with my own background of filters and experiences and learned ideas and so forth. So as I speak, I try to be respectful of both those to whom I'm speaking and most especially to those whom I will be speaking about. To that end, I have to confess that I find myself in a transition. Sometimes I refer to the people who inhab first inhabited our peninsula as Indians. Uh, that's certainly a holdover from my childhood. I played cowboys and Indians, and you know, one day we're, we were cowboys and one day we were Indians. Um, but as time went on, I worked really hard to get my tongue around the phrase of Native American, and I have quite often found myself stumbling as I tried to replace one with the other. Today, I, uh, I'm more inclined to, say, to lean towards something, saying something related to the people who first inhabited the peninsula. I do tell new docents to work with various names and use what they become familiar with and comfortable with, but always to be willing to specifically speak to their listeners, to be respectful and to be flexible, and really to acknowledge that nothing is absolute. Joanne. Joanne is muted. Here, Joanne. Okay. Joanne is muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Uh, this idea of nothing being absolute certainly refers to the, the naming of the Native Americans who were the first inhabitants on our peninsula. Today, many people call these inhabitants the Tongva, meaning people of the earth, coming from their language, the word Tongvar, meaning the mother earth. Although we know this is not what they called themselves, um, and this wasn't always the way it was. In the 1770s, these people were gathered from throughout the LA basin into the mission San Gabriel <clears throat> and were changed, their name changed to the Gabrielino Indians. Some were taken into the San Fernando mission and became Fernanditos, but generally most of the people here in the LA basin were referred to as Gabrielinos. In the 17, 1970s and the 1980s, they self-determined as Tongva, as I said, people of the earth. But that, that, that name is not used by all the Native Americans living in the Los Angeles area today. 
A couple of years ago, Brian and I visited the Temple Homestead in the city of industry. And I was surprised to find a pamphlet in their visitor center with the word Tongva encircled in you know, one of those bright red circles with a red slash through the, meaning, through the middle of it, obviously meaning not Tongva. The Ameri Native Americans affiliated with that historic site prefer the name Kiza. And Kiza is the name for the structure, which was the home of the people that they relate to. Another name is Kumivit. And that seems to be a name that some consider the uh, native peoples to have called themselves prior to the Spanish arrival. But as I said, nothing is absolute. But there are two ideas to keep in mind. One comes from William Macaulay in his book, The First Angelinos, which is a definitive study of the pre-mission Gabrielinos. And he defines the Tongva as one of the most materially rich and culturally influential of Southern California Indian groups. Wikipedia, that worldwide source of knowledge and information, identifies the Tongva as the most powerful indigenous people to inhabit Southern California. So some pretty lofty ideas. Here in the bottom left, we have a map of the area that the Tongva people, people have laid claim to. It stretches from the San Gabriel Mountains to the sea, maybe as far in as Mount Wilson or even as far as Mount Baldy. <clears throat> and from Topanga Canyon in the Malibu area down to Laguna Beach. Bruce Miller in his 1991 book, The Gabrielino says, if you stand on the shores of Long Beach, the Tongva resided 50 miles in every direction. Not only to the mountains and on the edge of the deserts, but certainly out onto San Clemente Island, St. Nicholas Island, Santa Barbara, and Catalina Islands. Your microphone is muted again, Joanne. As you can see, this is from an article in the Torrance Daily Breeze in November of last year. The article was accompanied by two really good maps. This first one here gives you an idea of the location of Native American tribes across the country, continent, by language. It is a 1901 Smithsonian map. Um, reading from the slide, the article highlights languages but next to this map, it states, California might be one of the most diverse states today, but before Europeans arrived, it was the most diverse place in North America. Former Governor Jerry Brown in, uh, 19, in 2019 wrote in a uh, uh, introduction to an art exhibit catalog, he wrote these words, culturally and linguistically, California was the most diverse place on the planet when Juan Cabrillo first put ashore in 1542. He was, of course, talking way beyond just languages. Take a moment and look at this map. Notice the broad flat plains of middle America. What do you see? Three smaller areas, brown, kind of mustardy yellow and green, bounded by an expanse of orange on the east of it or on the right of it. That area was, was the Sioux Nation. And on the left of those three little islands uh, is the Shoshonan area shown in mustard yellow. There's a larger patch of light brown stretching from Canada down into Indiana, um, Illinois, and Ohio that represents the Algonquin. Other than those three vast areas, there are several medium-sized patches throughout the Southwest and the Southeast. But focus your attention on California. The number of groups in this, on this map is almost uncountable. Now granted, as you look at it, that it begins, our area is part of the Shoshonan area, which is, um, it's important. Um, uh, as I, let's see, <laughs> you may be familiar with some of the names of the Tongva villages here on the peninsula. 
where Redondo meets PV Estates near Malaga Cove and St. Francis Episcopal Church was the village Chawunga. Avatinga or Savatinga is the village at the Point Vicente area. Just about where Abalone Cove Park and Terrania are today was Tuvimanga. And around the harbor side of the peninsula was Suananga, the site of Kin Malloy Park and Machado Lake in Harbor City today. Do these native names sound familiar? Tuvimanga, Chawalinga, aren't they similar to Cucamonga, Tahunga, Coenga, and Topanga? These common names in the LA Basin today, typically ending with Inga, come from the native of names for those places and from the language spoken by the Native Americans who inhabited them. As Bruce Miller said, if you stand on the shores of Long Beach, the Tong will reside in 50 miles in every direction. So these names connect the lands with us today. <laughs> Why was it doing that? Let's go the right direction, I apologize. Um, the Bering Land Bridge, although it seemed to emerge about 20,000 years ago, was an open corridor through the ice-covered North American Arctic. It was too barren to support human migrations before around 12,600 years ago. The land bridge is, post is the postulated route of human migration to the Americas from Asia between 12,500 years ago when the passage was no longer too barren to support life, and 11,000 years ago when the route became impassable due to the sea's encroachment. The route was open then for about 1,500 years. So one thought is, yes, thousands of years ago, the Native Americans who resided here in the LA Basin and here in our South Bay were part of that late great land migration which finds its roots in the Bering Land Bridge. It's not a stretch to think that once they had settled in the Great Basin, some time later, they turned west and headed to the west coast of North America. And the language connection seems to support this thought. However, it is also generally accepted that the era of human occupation, occupancy on the North American coastlines was 15,000 years ago, arriving at the Channel Islands. On the left is the um, ar archeological site on Santa Rosa Island where they found the Arlington woman. This, was, this dig was in, the in 1959, 1960, and um, a set of late Pleistocene human remains were discovered. Originally, they were identified as the Arlington woman. Over the years, she became the Arlington man, and today she's reverted to being the Arlington woman. These, are these remains are acknowledged to be the oldest skeleton found on our entire continent. It is stated that the Arlington woman lived between 10 and 13,000 years ago. Now keep in mind, the land bridge was 11 to 12,000 years ago. Of course, on the right-hand side in the corner, you, I hope you recognize the Point Vicente display of the ancient bison bone, one of our newer displays, a favorite of mine as it is an exciting story because one of our own found it while hiking on the peninsula. peninsula. This knowledgeable man, <laughs> Uh, took, his, it took the ancient remnant and process, processed it through appropriate scientific tests to help tell its story. The display shows marking on the bone by some sort of tool, a knife or perhaps a hatchet, indicating that the animal did not die naturally, but was part of a hunt by humans. Scientific dating indicates that this bone is about 13,500 years old and therefore humans were at least here on the peninsula 13,500 years ago. The signage in the museum refers to these people as Paleo-Indians. All of this is to say, we do not know where our Tongva people came from. When speaking with students, we tell them 
Six to 10,000 years ago, Native American people arrived on the peninsula. We have evidence that people were on the peninsula 13,500 years ago. There is the Bering, the Bering Land Bridge trek and then out to the coast from the Great Basin or across the sea onto the local Channel Islands and then onto the coast. Or perhaps it was across the land bridge and down the west coast of the continent without the long trek into the Great Basin. Again, nothing is absolute. I apologize, I always go the wrong way on this stuff. Here we go. This slide I've used every time I've talked because it puts, it puts as succinctly as I can um, a, a sort of timeline. So six to 10,000 years ago is what we tell our guests, Native American people arrive here on the peninsula. 500 AD or 1200 years ago, these people occupied all the lands attributed to them. So think back again to the comment, if you stand on the shore of Long Beach, 50 miles in every direction. 1200 AD or about 800 years ago, um, they were at the peak of their culture. In 1542, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo has, records the first encounters on Catalina in, and in San Pedro. In 1602, about 400 years ago, um, Vizcayeno, Sebastian Vizcayeno, um, enters the Tongvin territory and finds European diseases already. No, that Vizcayeno enters the territory on Catalina and on coastal sites. It's in 1767 when Gaspar de, po de, po de Portola enters the Tongvin territory himself and discovers that even at that point, even European diseases were already destroying populations. 1771, the mission San Gabriel is founded and conversion begins and the Native American population decreases to 75%, about 3,500. From 1833 to 1850, the Mexican government rules our area. In 1840, the last of the Tongva villages are destroyed. In 1850, California becomes part of the union. The US government agrees to give 8.5 million acres in a treaty to the people of, of the base, the native peoples of the LA basin, a treaty that is never ratified. By the end of the 1800s, the population is about one to 2% of its original size. In the 1980s, these people self-determined as the Tongva people. And in 1994, the city of San Gabriel and the California state legislature approve resolutions that recognize the Tongva as the indigenous people of the LA basin with a continuous and unbroken history. What does that say about the Kiza and the Kumibit? It is not a federally and identified and acknowledged American tribe. So there is no federal funding for them. We have no local casinos. And once again, nothing is absolute. Oops, other direction. This map is from California's Gabrielino Indians by Bernice Easton Johnson, published by the Southwest Museum in 1962, and was originally done by Alan Welts in 1958. And this is only a small portion of his map. I had wanted to focus on the, um, the villages and, and names here in the South Bay. On it, you see Tongva villages and gathering sites across a portion of the LA basin. When I spoke with Craig Torres, a member of the Tongva tribe, he advised me that we need to look at maps such as this as maps of alliances. Today, we may look at this map as a map of the Tongva people in the basin, but in re reality, we do not know if the people looked at one another as a, tr a one tribe, neighboring groups, evil familial familial relations. 
Again, nothing is absolute. What we do know, if you look at Malibu, it is marked with Chumash. Surely we know the Chumash people stretched from Ventura North to San Luis Obispo and perhaps beyond. But it is now thought that the people who lived in Malibu, as it was a bordering area, were perhaps bilingual, bicultural, and maybe even bifamilial, speaking both Chumash and Tongvin. We know that the Chumash people of Carpinteria were bolt builders and that the Tongvo worked and traded with them for some of their seagoing boats. And as every California school child learns, acorns from the mighty oaks of the foothills made for a favorite food. The coastal Tongva people surely traded with those in the foothill areas, say Pasadena and Glendora, for this dietary staple. So it is a map of alliances, trading paths, sharing skills, perhaps tying families, villages, and maybe even a tribe together. But it is not necessarily a unified group of people stretching all the way from Malibu to Long Beach to Cucamonga and to Pacoima, the Tongva tribe. Um, Anne mentioned that I also work over at the marsh, and these are photos that I took of at the marsh. Um, the one on the top left is in February a couple of years ago. And I actually took the picture because that water is covering two major uh, pathways, driveways, and the whole area was completely inundated with water. The other three are all in August, and you can see some of them look very dry and some of them look very green, and that's, that's the truth of the situation. The one thing you need to take out of these pictures with your mind is anything that looks like a eucalyptus tree because they would not have been there. Um, the Tongva are identified as a hunter-gatherer population, but a better description is that they were the ultimate conservationists. For them, life revolved around the environment. You needed to acquire food, shelter, etc. Basically, the men were hunters and the women were gatherers but it is not a set pattern. Instead, they followed the rhythm of the seasons. The marsh, which right now is very seasonally appropriate, very, very dry, is always full of tulies, a form of bulrushes when in season. They have to mow through the tulies in the summer to keep the mosquitoes at bay. Along with tulies, there are willows and many other plants which attract a variety of animals. I understand that what you see at the Madrona Marsh today is how the whole South Bay area from Redondo into Gardena down to San Pedro and beyond once looked. I've heard that not that long ago, and I'm not speaking in the time of Indians, but maybe when I was a child and in the appropriate season, you could canoe from Redondo to San Pedro on the inland side of the peninsula. When you look at our Kiza in our Native American display, those tulis and willow branches were really just over the hill, easily gathered and brought to the local village in an appropriate season. The Native Americans moved from site to site, depending on the season and the whims of nature, where foods were plentiful or where they were available for harvesting. But they did not travel much outside of their own village group. There may have been one, one person designated to be a communicator between groups, but for the most, pun, most time, once they settled in an area, they stayed there. They were somewhat territorial in their areas and they did not encroach on others without seeking permission. Here we go. I apologize. I don't know why this is so difficult for me. <clears throat> Linda Gonzalez, another member of the Tongvin community who used to teach classes at Madrona Marsh, defined the Tongva as a cordage-based culture. I love that term. In her words, everything was tied, wrapped, bundled, bound, etc. They used the fibers of yucca-type plants, 
the strands of deer grass and the twisting vining stems of milkweed as a base for cordage. Then they wove, twisted, tied into a myriad of sacks, mats, traps, and baskets. On the left-hand corner down here are a few examples of their world-renowned basketry from the Southwest Gene Autry Museum in Griffith Park. Tulis and willows, as I described, from all over the inland basin were used for baskets, mats, and structures. Their, home, their homes were given form by the willow branches and tulis and other similar plants were used for covering. Or the tulis were bundled together for their light raft-like boats, which we know as tumuls. Well, now it's not going to go either direction. We are all aware that the Tongva made use of everything that surrounded them here on the coast. We tell our guests that 75% of what they used in their everyday life came from the ocean. Of course, the fish and shellfish added to their varied diet. The shells themselves were used as utilitarian bowls, hooks, sharp edged pieces, as well as for decoration and beauty. Then there's the soapstone found only on Catalina, soft enough to carve, yet able to withstand the heat of cook fires, as well as being very durable. I was fascinated, but not surprised to learn that soapstone appears only in the zones where tectonic plates are subducted the subduction changing rocks by heat and pressure with an influx of fluids, but without melting. I've already discussed the raft-like tomo boats, but all, and also the plank boats, safer for ocean-going needs, that were traded for from neighboring people in Carpinteria. And I love to explain to guests about the tar that both my mother and I, and probably our guests themselves, have scraped from the feet of young children after a day at the beach. Then I use the more official sounding word, asphaltum, to explain how this naturally seeping substance was used to both heat items in flat baskets and as an adhesive to hold shells together, as shown in our case. I hope you know of those two particular abalone shells that I'm speaking about. Then one day last year, I opened my Los Angeles Times to come across this headline, Ancient Water Bottles Hold a Dirty Secret. Scientists replicate a 5,000-year-old manufacturing process to reveal a toxic past. Here, I have to stop and tell you that I went down the rabbit hole of the internet trying to completely understand the definitions of absaltum and bituum, bituminum, and tar. The bit shown here explains a little more clearly than, than, uh, more clearly than others, although it's still, to me, very confusing. So tar is a resinous, usually brownish or blackish substance. Asphalt is a mixture of dark bituminous pitch with sand or gravel. And bitumen is a black viscous mixture of hydrocarbonates naturally or, and that's manufactured from residue from petroleum distill distillation. What I mean when I use my more, more official sounding word asphaltum is a natural tar-like substance that washes ashore from oil seepages beneath the ocean. My research showed the use of asphaltum by Aboriginal peoples is well documented in early historic accounts and abundant archaeological evidence extends its use well back into the prehistoric era. All of this telling me asphaltum was the caulk, the glue, and the paint of the coastal natives. When heated, the viscosity decreases and the molten asphaltum can be applied, cooling to form a jet black waterproof coating, an adhesive or a decorative paint that can be applied to pots, 
bowls, baskets, and boats. Yeah, that's my story. That's what I tell our guests. That's asphaltum. The LA Times article refers to findings published in the Journal of Environmental Health in July of 2019. And it says the ingredient that might have harmed the health of Native Americans is called bitumen. It is a form of raw petroleum that quite, ha quite handy in the days before glue and plastic. The sticky substance was an adhesive and a water repellent, making it useful in items including bottles and boats. Well, that also sounds like my story. What these scientists found when they made water bottles by weaving rush plants into bottles and coating them with bitumen was that was melted down but in hot pebbles in an abalone shell. And then they stored water in the containers for two months, taking samples every so often to see whether toxins were leaching into the water, which they were. What they found was that the pollutants were not high enough to present a serious health risk according to EPA standards. Okay, you can along with me now breathe a sigh of relief. However, the air samples that were taken during the bitumen melting process produced unhealthful concentrations of polysyllectic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs about the same concentration that is produced by smoking one and a half cigarettes. And that exceeds the EPA's safe limit. So Native Americans or any other ancient culture that used the same substance in process to make bottles or boats or baskets or bowls could have been harmed by breathing the contaminated smoke. Hmm, I wonder how serious that was. But that's only part of the story. Native people used bitumen as body paint, as casts for injuries, and as an all-purpose glue. Some of these uses may have resulted in dangerous levels of PH8, PAH exposure. Eric Bartolink, a bioarchaeologist and forensic anthropologist at Cal State Chico, agreed that bitumen probably didn't play a role in the demise of Native Americans. Even so, he added, this study will probably inspire other anthropologists to pay more attention to the environmental risks in the populations they study. So I acknowledge that the vase here on the left side of the screen is not a um, Tongan example but it is an example of a vase that's been coated with um, asphaltum or bitumen. And you can see how it was used. If you don't remember seeing our soapstone bowls in our display that are lined in the black asphaltum. Um, one other thing I found interesting was one of the definitions of bitumen re referred to it as the asphalt of Asia Minor used in ancient times as cement and mortar. So we are talking about affecting groups of people far beyond the Tongva people of our peninsula. Another article from the Los Angeles Times last year on abalone stated, the story of the abalone begins with the native people of the land who say the strength of the ocean is the abalone. Like the buffalo in the plains, the abalone in California were used for food, for tools, and for adornment. Their shells, brilliant and pearlescent on the inside, were cherished and traded as far as New Mexico, where just one could buy a horse. Of course, you know the woman sitting in the right-hand side from our PBIC display. She has an abalone bowl on her lap and the decorations on her skirt, on her skirt are abalone. She wears a necklace made of other seashells. For years, I have told PBIC guests that I'd always heard as a child that sh these shells were to have been, were found to have been traded as far away as New Mexico. Never had I heard that the price of just one could buy a horse. 
As for the other shells, decorating our tongue woman, this year I read that they, they now think they were traded and prized as far east as Mississippi. Quite a stretch. Oh my gosh, we do this again. Tuvim Nor, Tuvim Moore, oh, there's a spelling error on there. Tuvim Moore Rock on the left, you may have seen. It is just north of Terrania, visible from PV Drive as you buy, drive by. I was initially taught that this is the site of the Tongva creation story. It is a beautiful setting. Tuvimanga, the two shots on the right-hand side of the screen, one looking from the north and one looking from the south, it, due to its close location to Tuvi Moor, just south of Terrania, I believe, has recently been considered by some as a place for summer solstice celebrations and the possible site of the Tongva creation story. Just this week, I'm studying a map that, an, um, an interactive map, um, they highlighted a little village inland from Long Beach on a stream as another possible creation site for the Tongva Indians. So once again, nothing is absolute. We do have proof that native peoples identified today as Tongva lived here on the peninsula. In 1936 and through 1937, there were excavations by the Southwest Museum and USC um, in the Malaga Cove area, very close to St. Francis Episcopal Church. There were thousands of artifacts found. And as one, um, one of the uh, archeologists said, so much game, seafood and wild plants, they never needed to develop farming. farming. What was found was three layers of evidence that people had lived in this little encampment area. Layer one was the uh, lowest layer, so the oldest layer. And what was apparent there was that they consumed raw shellfish. Level two gave evidence of cook fires, grinding stones, and the remains of uh, natives had been found in graves. Layer three, the most recent, showed that um, there was more animal protein in the foods that were being eaten and that graves were no longer made. The, the remains of the deceased were cremated. The last group was that, who, that was at this site, which is called Chuiwinga, was about 1775 and there were about 150 people. When I speak with our guests, the treatment of native people by the Spanish in the missions is often brought up. I admit I try to avoid discussion of the controversies, but I do not deny them. Recognizing that I also at some point represent both Los Serranos organization and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, I try to speak with care. I do point out the one absolutely positive contribution by the mission fathers is the mission baptismal records they left behind. These are the only written historical documentation we have concerning the people who resided here prior to the arrival of the Spanish. These records indicate villages and um, um, little tiny alcoves of communities that the people came from. These two images are replicas of what is considered to be Tongva artwork. There are Tongva pic pictographs. They are very rare, having for the most part been destroyed by the development throughout the Los Angeles area. There are paintings at a few sites in the San Gabriel Mountains and in the northwestern part of the San Fernando Valley, but none are accessible by the public. So what happened? You've seen the maps, 
you've heard me say to look at a map as a map of alliances. We do not know if this was one large sprawling tribe or many, many small, possibly familial groups related by language, perhaps by background. I have heard one member of today's Tongva tribe say, it is a spider web of connectiveness. Where did they come from? We don't know. Why are they here? There's no answer, but surely like you and I, they've stayed for the abundant life and the temperate climate. As I stated earlier, Macaulay identified the Tongva as one of the most materially rich and culturally influential of Southern California Indian groups. And Wikipedia identified the Tongva as the most powerful indigenous people to inhabit Southern California. Basically, the Tongva were described as a friendly people. If there was a conflict between villages, it might have been over a failure at gift giving ceremonies, perhaps poaching or trespassing, or hurtful sorcery, which might have resulted in conflict. But most tribal conflicts were resolved by song fights. Days long singing of insulting songs in vile language accompanied by much stamping and tramping of the ground. Yet today, there is very little real evidence, very little is really known about the Tongva and almost nothing is absolute. On my list of dates, the last I mentioned was 1994 when the city of San Gabriel and the California legislature recognize the Tongva as the indigenous people of the LA basin with a continuous and unbroken history. At this point, I can update that information. The Tongva, this is a quote, were, are also pursuing the goal of achieving federal recognition as a tribe. Anthropologist Alice Merles of Claremont McKenna College published in 2013, Identity on Trial, this Gabrielino Tongva quest for federal recognition. Written to enrich the scarce body of literature about the Tongva and to reach both policymakers and a general audience. Today, the state of California and the cities of both Los Angeles and San Gabriel re already recognize the Tongva as a tribe. You may have read just this past Monday that, again, in the path of development, workers digging beneath the sidewalk in Santa Ana uncovered what appears to be the remains of a complete human skeleton, determined to be at least 100 years old and apparently to be those of a Native American person, perhaps a member of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe. Just one month earlier, about two miles from that site, Crews excavating for the Orange County Streetcar Project also found Native American bones. In both cases, the Gabrielino Tongva chief, Anthony Morales, also known as Chief Red Blood, was recognized as the descendant responsible for recommending a place and a method of burial. He shared, finds such as these are not uncommon, but they are emotionally jarring. The article goes on to comment on many other similar findings and how they have been handled in the past. Orange County Sheriff Coroner Sergeant Dennis Breckner commented, it makes you wonder how many are under us every day. And that's my presentation. Okay, if anyone has any questions for Joanne, please unmute your mic and feel free to ask. And I want to say that my introduction did nothing in preparing you for this wonderful presentation that Joanne just gave. Yes, it did. You said every you told everyone I'd been to the Madrona Marsh. <laughs> and I, I want to say if you've never been there, it, it, as a docent, it really enriches what you say to guests when you're in our, our center. So take the opportunity to go over and, and, and see the marsh. <clears throat> this is Adela. I've got a comment. I don't know if you guys are aware, but um, a couple of 
well, maybe before the shutdown, there's been a Tongva uh, gathering uh, every year. I think it might have been spring or summer in Madrona Marsh. And um, they would tell stories. I don't, I don't know if you guys have gone to it. Um, they no, would I have don't anything about that. You know, I'm aware of it. I have never gone somehow. I don't, it always falls when, when, when I'm not around. I will say these pictures here are of, uh, I, I believe the first Americans of Bologna are, are the ones who took them. And they're from Tongva Park, which is in Santa Monica. And I, the, the other little bit of information in the bottom left-hand corner, I happened to go to University High School in Los Angeles. That's where I graduated from. And I, I knew that we had a, a native, a, a natural stream on campus and that there was purportedly Indians that had lived there. And it is now quite a site um, that's been developed there. And I hope to go up there and visit one day soon when you know things are back and open again. So uh, yes, the Tongva community is active in our area. You know, if you put your ear to the ground, you will hear about gatherings like the one at, at the marsh. Yeah, and you know, I, I didn't think of it. Maybe I'll, if they have it again, I'll let Ann know because it is a fabulous thing to attend. You're right there in with the, um, in the wetland area of the marsh with the willows all around you. And, you know, they're saying that the Native Americans did live there and they're, they're playing songs. They've got a, a, a drum, um, a, a large drum in the middle that they all play. And then they teach the people that attend um, some of the dances and they share food and tell legends and it's just fabulous. I know Linda attends that. Joanne, maybe we could plan a field trip to the cultural center next summer or when things start to open up. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. If we could attend that, it's a, it's a wonderful well, Adele, you're talking about Madrona Marsh. I'm talking about the Curubunga Springs Very Cultural good. Center. <laughs> oh, right, right. Either one. Well, maybe both. How about we could do both? Well, I know the, that this uh, this cultural center at Uni High, they they have an annual day as well. I was reading quite a bit about them this week. So um, it's very interesting, you know, and, and some of the articles that I've seen in the LA Times, one, they've added, they added to it, they have an interactive map and all sorts of things. And so you know, we are not the only people that are talking about the Tongva. <laughs> yeah, there is a wonderful uh, Tongva village reconstruction in Heritage Park in Santa Fe Springs. And they have an annual celebration for, for the Tongva there as well. And there is also another one uh, in Mount Baldy Village, way up at the uh, foothills of the uh, San Gabriels. And uh, they're very authentic. Uh, the way that they've developed it and uh, something that uh, we could take a field trip to that would be phenomenal. Yeah, I used to live out down at the base of Baldy in Upland and um, I read a couple of years ago that it's uh, used to be called Santa Ana Botanic Garden. It's now California State Botanic Garden in Claremont. They have a uh, Tongva village and I was like, Really? You know, I'm not even sure the Tongva were out that far. And, and yeah, some of my research says oh, it's a stretch. But I do think that the Tongva today are really trying to, to, to reach out and, and, and be as visible, visible, visible as possible toward trying, and, and the effort is toward trying to be get, get federal recognition. Yeah, and I think your picture of uh, Pam Monroe uh, from UCLA uh, teaching Tonga language is really important. I talked to Jacob Gutierrez, who is a, a Tongva and has moved out of the state since then. Uh, and he told me that uh, they had done considerable amount of research uh, with the uh, anthropologist who had taken recordings of the last remaining Tongva on their deathbeds. And uh, they, uh, they were put into the National Archives and pretty much forgotten about. And then uh, certain members of the Tongva went back there and spent weeks and weeks and weeks transcribing what those um, uh, recordings were. And Pam Monroe used those as a uh, vehicle to develop a, a alphabet 
and then from there to develop a language and from there to uh, put sounds together to come up with the language. And it's, it's phenomenal how that uh, has uh, uh, evolved over the period of the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I quoted William McCauley, the first Angelinos, and it's a book that's in our library. His information is from this uh, same guy who made the, the recordings. It's Harry, the anthropologist named Harrington. And so, yeah, they, they have gone back and connected as close as they possibly can to be able to authenticate something that, you know, was just about wiped off the earth. Yeah, and as I understand it, there were no recorded histories. Uh, it was all oral uh, tradition passed down from father to son, and et cetera. And right. so uh, finally, uh, they are uh, taking these oral traditions and uh, putting them in written Tongva language, and they're teaching their Tongva history to their own tribe, which is phenomenal. What a, what a uh, recovery. Well, we had quite a wealth, you know, in our own grasp. Um, I remember John Nieto out talking and saying, you know, I used to follow my grandmother, and this is, you know, I did this, and that's what she expected of me. And, it, it, you know, those stories are, are not that far away from us. Thank you, Ann. Terrific job, Joanne. Thanks. That, that's amazing, Joanne.